service will be a blessing to each of you as you are safe at home. Uh, a few announcements, uh, announcements this week. Uh, just be looking out for your email for upcoming events. Um, we'll let you know more throughout the week uh, about what our next week will be looking like. So just give a heads up to all your emails. Also, um, we do have planned uh, so far, if anything changes, just watch your email, but January the 24th, uh, so next Sunday, um, finance at five and COM at six. So if anything else changes, just be watching for your email. Now, prayer concerns, just going forth, um, as uh, many of you may have seen from your email and uh, through Facebook, Miss Peggy Cardwell passed away Thursday. Her funeral will be at Forest Lawn in Goodlettsville. Visitation Wednesday the 20th from 12 to 2. The funeral will be at 2 that Wednesday. And just we want to continue to pray for uh, for Sharon and Jake, um, Miss Peggy. Um, I just don't think there's words to just say how wonderful that woman was and how kind-hearted and what an amazing example of a Christian woman she was to our church. And so she will be extremely missed. So we love you, Sharon, and we love you, Jake, and we uh, we will pray pray for you in this uh, great time of loss. Other people to bring forth this week, um, Miss Stacy Willis is at Vanderbilt Hospital, so we want to lift up Miss Stacy and pray that she is better soon. And Howard Allgood is awaiting results of a scope, so please please uh, pray for uh, Miss Stacy and Mr. Howard as. Uh, as they await and as they heal. Any others to bring forth? Well, let's rejoice together and sing the beautiful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please stand as you are able at home. <laughs>
is there for you. The Holy Spirit is with you and is empowering you. And so we come in the power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as we pray today. Let us have a time of silent prayer, and then I will share a prayer on your behalf. Let us pray. and wonderful God, we give you thanks today that we know you in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We think about a Father who loves us, who cares for us, who protects us and watches over us, who knows us by name and is always there for us. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has saved us from our sins who is willing to go to the cross to die for each of us. That is the kind of love that we dwell in this morning. We thank you so much that we are redeemed and saved people. And we thank you that you have called us today to share the good news of Jesus Christ with all that we meet. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes in our time of need, that offers us comfort, that brings us peace, that convicts us of our sins, and lets us know when we are headed in the wrong direction. And so we would pray today, come Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and dwell among your people. We have many needs today, O oh gracious God, that we would lift up to you. We are thinking so much about the Pegley's family today. What a great lady. What a wonderful witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would hold that family so close to you today and let them feel your comforting presence and draw sweet memories for them of this wonderful and great lady. We also pray for those that are suffering today. We, we pray for, for Stacy this morning that your healing hand would be upon her and for Howard as he waits for these test results. Just, just dwell with him and let him know that he is not alone during this time. And for others that are sick this morning, that are suffering, that are, are feeling a lot, of, little, a lot of anxiety today, we just ask for the peace of Christ to be with these persons. And we thank you so much for this church and for all it means to this community. We thank you for the way that we are on mission, that we are continuing to lift up the name of Christ in this community. And gracious God, on this weekend, when we remember the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, may we remember to be people of justice and righteousness. May we remember not to judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And so let us seek to be Christ-like as we deal with others each day. We ask all of these things in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught his children to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Miss Judy, would you come forward now to share with our children? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. Did you have snow outside yesterday? Yes. Yes. 
it wasn't enough to do much of a snowman. And if you were a sleepyhead, it might have been melted by the time you got up. Well, today I want to talk to you about what the scripture is going to be about today. I brought with me today some cookies. Who likes cookies? Oh, we all like cookies, don't we? Well, when I was thinking about talking about this today, it made me think of my daughter, Kate, when she was in preschool. And those of you that are maybe in preschool a mom's day out, or maybe you go um, to school and you take your lunchbox, how many of you have some kind of sweet treat in your lunchbox? Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes it might be fruit. Maybe your mom doesn't want you to have too much sugar at school. Your teachers probably appreciate that. <laughs> but Kate always had a sweet treat in her lunchbox. But the problem was, what do you think she always wanted to eat first? Her sandwich, her chips, or her sweet treat? Sweet. Her sweet treat. Now, this is, what, this is how it's going to relate to what we're talking about today. She was tempted to eat her sweet treat before she ate her sandwich. She needed her sandwich so it'd make her stay full a little bit longer. And she didn't need to have her sweet treat until she finished all of that. So she was tempted. And the scripture today is going to be talking about Jesus. When he was super, super hungry in the wilderness. And the devil came and he told him, well, if you're hungry, you can just make your own food from a rock. But Jesus knew that that was not the right thing to do. So he was tempted, just like sometimes we're tempted to eat our cookies first. So you know what Jesus did? He did not do that because he knew that that's not what he was supposed to do. So I just want you to remember that Jesus, just like you, sometimes are tempted to eat your cookies first. He was tempted too, so he knows what that feels like. So when you know that you're doing something you've been said, no, you don't need to do that. Just remember, that's happened to Jesus too. And, and when that happens, you can pray to him and he can help you, okay? So pray with me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for this day. And help me, and help me when, I am tempted. when I am tempted. We love you, God. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and we will read about the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey. <laughs> Good to see all of you. Again, I'm leading by example. There's a few more in the plate today. Hallelujah. It's multiplied. Amen. Uh, do want you to try to remember uh, to be supportive of your church and, and uh, give of your tithe and offering. And you've done such a good job of that while we've been virtual. 
we hope to be together again very soon just again keep watching for emails and, and uh, information from the church this week we're continuing to monitor the situation and we hope to get back together very soon so it is good to virtually see all of you today uh, brother Jason and today we're going to talk about temptation as you heard that's a, sometimes a difficult thing to preach on um, so today you're going to hear lots of, of information you're going to hear things from the Old Testament things that Jesus said we're going to reference some scripture we're going to find out if Moses played tennis or if David had a motorcycle all right are you with me so far so I hope that you'll stay tuned so we're going to find out what I mean by all that okay so this morning uh, we're going to just recap for just a minute. Last week I preached about the baptism of Jesus by his cousin John in the Jordan River. It was here that Jesus entered the waters of baptism to, as we heard, fulfill all righteousness. We talked about the fact that Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He hadn't sinned, but God led him to travel 70 miles to find his cousin John in the Judean wilderness at the Jordan River and to be baptized. And if you remember from last week, John tried to talk him out of it. Wait a minute, Jesus, you need to be baptizing me. He recognized who Jesus was. But I said last week that Jesus needed to identify with being human in every way except in sin. So in essence, Jesus says, just do it, John. The exact words were, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So let me ask you a question. Who is truly righteous? Are we righteous by our own merit? We try to be, but I think we fail at times, wouldn't you say? Um, sorry to bust your bubble, but... So we, we are not truly and perfectly righteous. You know, the wisest human who ever lived was reported to be King Solomon. And he wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. That is until Jesus. Remember I quoted 1 Corinthians 1.30 last week. Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And if you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We get to be made right with God, holy before God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You see, we've been bought at a price, the precious, the perfect blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Remember, it is by our faith in Jesus that we receive his righteousness. And so coming up out of the waters of baptism... We talked about how God claimed and called Jesus last week. He gave Jesus the power of his spirit to equip him to go all the way, to complete the rescue mission for humanity. God says, that's my son. That's my boy. I love you. I'm so proud of you. I'm pleased with you. See, Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness in order to share it with us. He had to be fully human, yet sinless in all regards, so that by giving up his life on the cross for each of us, he was taking upon himself all the sins of the world so that we could have his righteousness by our faith in him alone. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no plan B. It's got to be through Jesus. And Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness first. So we learned last week that Jesus was baptized. 
This week, Jesus was tempted. So the very next verses follow Jesus' journey. Right after almost his hair still dripping wet, you get the sense of. The Spirit of God within Jesus that had just descended upon him leads him, urges him into the wilderness. What for? The Bible says to be tempted by the devil. Y'all have room for that in your mind? I, I'm not beyond saying sometimes I have trouble with some scriptures and trying to wrestle with this. That's okay. That's okay. But I wondered if you have room for that in your mind. You know, just two chapters later, Jesus tells the disciples, this is how you should pray. And we prayed this a minute ago. And part of the Lord's Prayer, one of the things Jesus says is, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So why does Jesus face temptation? Well, the same reason he was baptized. To fulfill all righteousness. Hebrew 4 15 says this about Jesus. For we do not have a high priest, again talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. See, I can empathize with anyone facing temptation because I face it too. What about y'all? You know what empathy is, church? It's being able to relate. It's being able to walk in those shoes someone else. Be able to say, I've been there too. And so Jesus went through temptation while here on earth so he can relate. But the difference between any of us and Jesus is that Jesus doesn't only empathize with your temptation. He can save you from it because he did not sin. He has fulfilled all righteousness. I'm going to tell you something that's hard to admit, church. I'm a sinner. I fall into temptation. I fail. I don't have righteousness of my own. I think we can all say that. But isn't it hard sometimes to say that? I have faced temptation and lost. Many times, in fact. If I had any aspirations of being righteous, that was shattered when I was five. I remember it. My mother, if she was here, she would remember it. I remember the first time that I gave in to temptation. I was in kindergarten. And I felt compelled to do something very naughty. And I did it. During the bathroom break, I stuffed all of the toilet paper down the commode, flushed it, clogging the toilet and flooding the bathroom floor, and water ran under the door and went into the classroom. I got in a lot of trouble for that. With the teacher, with the principal, who I was terribly afraid of, and with my parents. After doing it, I was horrified. I was a pretty good kid. I couldn't believe I'd done that. I was a quiet kid. I was the kind of kid who, if you just looked at me with disappointment, <laughs> I would just wither up into a ball and just cry because I was I had disappointed someone. Anybody else like that? <laughs> yeah. Catherine can relate. And I'm really kind of still that way. So I was a quiet kid, and so I remember the disappointment of my mother. And it's a funny story now. She loves to tell it, but I, it wasn't so funny then. And I remember her asking me why I did it. And all I could say was, and I remember this plainly at the age of five, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. In reality, the devil doesn't make us do anything. See, we have to give in to temptation. That's when the problem occurs. So Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It was a time of preparation for Jesus' ministry. 
leading up to that time when he would return to Galilee and begin his, his ministry. And he prayed, I'm sure he reflected on God's word, had some alone time with God. See, Jesus hadn't begun to preach yet. He hadn't been calling disciples yet or stood in the synagogue in Nazareth and said, I am fulfilling the words of Isaiah. He had moved to Capernaum and began to perform miracles. At this point in his life, Jesus was still relatively unknown. So after receiving God's Spirit and, and hearing God speak words of identity and love and affirmation over him, Jesus was then led to a very unforgiving area, the wilderness of Judea. I have seen it. Has anybody ever been to the badlands of South Dakota? That's what it looks like. It's, it's, there, nothing grows there. I mean, even to this day, the only thing I ever saw in the Judean wilderness was one camel. There's no sheep. There's no people. There's nothing. There's not very much water either. And it was in this place that Jesus would be subjected to the same temptations that we as humans undergo. He would face the big three. Now, all of them involved the bigger temptation of doubting God. But let's break them down just a minute. He would be tempted to do things for himself, to put God to the test, and to worship the things of this world over God, idolatry. Now, these are the same temptations that Adam and Eve had in the garden. And that God's chosen people, Israel, faced and would give in to. And really the same temptations that we all face and give in to. But Jesus would not. So let's look at how that went down. Shall we? The Bible says that after 40 days and nights without food in the wilderness. That the devil showed up to tempt Jesus. Now Luke says that the devil was tempting him the whole time. And I don't doubt that. But when he's at his weakest. That's when the real temptations really come. And that's the way the devil works, not just with Jesus, but with all of us. Can't you imagine 40 days without food? I think only Moses and maybe Elijah ever did that. And he was tired and weak and isolated and alone. And that's just when the devil likes to enter into our lives. Let's take you back just a minute to the Old Testament. As the children of Israel were on their way to the promised land after leaving behind the slavery in Egypt, they began to get hot and tired. It's just like a kid on a road trip. Are we there yet? Can I go to the bathroom? I'm thirsty. You read it. It's just, it's so comical. And so, you know, a million people out in the wilderness, out in the, the wilderness of, of sin is what it's called actually in the Sinai Peninsula. They left Egypt, they're headed to the promised land, and they begin to get hungry and thirsty and hot and tired and their feet hurt and are we there yet? And they begin to doubt that God's going to take care of them. Read Exodus 17. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses, and they said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Were there no graves in Egypt? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? I think that's the cry of some pastors. <laughs> what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile with. I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Don't we do that too, church? God, where are you? Are you for me or against me? Aren't you going to take care of this? Are you real? These are real questions. I've had them. Are you going to leave me here to languish, to thirst, to suffer? We need a sign from you, God, to prove you're who you say you are. Are you with us or not? 
And they did it again and again and again, and we do that too. And you know, when they got to the promised land, the, the Israelites, they doubted that God would be able to deliver that land to them. They saw all of the people there, the cities and the fortifications. And so guess what? God took them back into the wilderness. Y'all aren't ready yet. They needed time to trust. And during those 40 years, God provided for them. Do you remember manna, the bread from heaven, the food of angels? Each morning, they would have that. And they would learn to live not by bread alone, but by the truth of God's word and his provision. So 40 years they wandered in the wilderness until they finally put their whole trust in God to provide and to protect for them. And then you have Moses' farewell address in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he's saying, remember, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order that you know what is in your heart, whether or not you're going to keep my commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known about, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Remember that last part. You're going to hear it again in a minute. You see, sometimes God takes us to the wilderness to show us that it isn't all about us. Does that sound familiar? It's all about God. He will take care of us, but we have to believe him. And we have to know his word so we can say with confidence the sermon title today, it is written. Do you know that Jesus said that more than anyone else in the Bible? Reverend Rita read it three times today in the passage. It is written. Well, we know that Israel would not continue to keep God's commands. They failed in their mission to be the light to all people just as Adam and Eve had failed to listen to God in the garden. But in the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus, to do what others had not been able to do. Jesus would pass the test, and it's important for you to know how he did it. He did it by relying on God's word. It is written, Jesus would say, pointing us back to the faithfulness and the promises made by God. So the temptation of Jesus was not about fulfilling all righteousness as much as it was about also reminding us of the character and the goodness of God. And those are found in God's word. It is written. So God sent Jesus into the wilderness. Let's get back to that. And that's where we are too, sometimes. And the way out of the wilderness is to trust and obey God. But first we're put to the test. Jesus demonstrates for us how we get out of the wilderness. You see, Jesus had just received the sonship from God, and now the devil wanted to try and reshape Jesus' brand new understanding of that into a worldly model of pride and power and idolatry through relentless temptation. Jesus was alone. He was tired. He was hungry. He was vulnerable. And that's good campaign weather for the devil. Amen? Amen? Yeah. In the end, this epic battle between Satan and the Son of God was won by Jesus. He didn't give in. Where Adam and Eve had failed in the lush garden, Jesus did not. Even in the barren desert. Where Israel failed to remain obedient, Jesus would not fail. He got it right, and because of that, the battle over our lives, over our souls, and our future with God began to take a turn. I'm a student of history, and if you look at World War II, there's a couple of decisive moments in the battles where now looking back with hindsight, we can see that's where things began to turn. So for the war in the Pacific, many people think it was the Battle of Midway where the Japanese carriers were sunk. Things began to turn in our favor. For the war in Europe, Stalingrad. Hitler's army was, was thinned out and not well supplied. And the Russians fought really hard. And there were a lot of casualties. 
But things began to turn. Those two moments really began to change the course of the war. Here's the turning point right here. That's what happens when you step away from the pulpit. You lose your place. <laughs> Jesus got it right. And because of that, the battle over our lives, over our souls and our future with God took that turn. The cross was really the moment of victory, but the battle began to turn in the wilderness of temptation when the devil was unsuccessful at deceiving Jesus. And we're meant to see that the weapon Jesus wielded against the devil, Scripture, each time Jesus would counter the devil with, it is written. Ephesians 6 speaks of the armor of God. You're familiar with this passage, I hope. And there's a lot of parts to it. And trust me, we'll have a sermon series on it one day. But the very last part of the armor of God, kind of the, the weapon, the best part, is the sword of the Spirit, the very word of God. It was with that sword that Jesus fought off each temptation of the devil. And if Jesus did it, so can we. Notice how Jesus overcame these temptations. It is written, it is written, it is written. He quoted Deuteronomy 8 and Deuteronomy 6. Now that suggests that Jesus had been studying the scriptures. Now you may say, well, Jesus is the scriptures. Jesus is the word. But I would say to you, although Jesus is fully divine, he's also fully human, and he had to lay aside his glory. Jesus had to learn how to walk. Jesus had to learn how to talk. The creator of the stars had to learn how to work wood with his hands. Guess what? We learn here Jesus had to get the word just like we did. He had to read it. If that's good enough for Jesus, is it good enough for us, church? Amen. So from within these two chapters of Deuteronomy, Jesus draws on material that he had read and learned in the spirit which came so powerfully upon him at his baptism, was able to take these scriptures and use them in spiritual warfare against the devil. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. You know, and if we don't know our way around scriptures, or we don't trust the spirit in warfare against Satan, we're not going to share in the victory of God's son. But if we do, the spirit will bring scriptures to our attention when temptation comes, and it's going to, we have the power to overcome it. But you have to read and know God's Word. I hate to break it to you, church. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to read this book at some point. Many of you probably have, maybe many times. But I want to challenge you, church. Read it. You gotta know it. It's good enough for Jesus. I hope you read it over and over again. You need to know it. So that when the temptations come or the false doctrine is preached, you can say to it is written. So notice that Jesus is tempted three ways. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, now listen, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those three, come not from the Father but from the world. These are the three ways that the devil tempts Jesus and us as well. First, he appeals to Jesus' physical appetite. Miss Jenny talked about that. I would have went with the cookies, Miss Jenny. I would have done it. Remember, Jesus hadn't eaten in 40 days, and he begins, the devil begins by sowing doubt. Always. Just like in the garden, remember what the serpent said to Eve? Are you sure that God said that? Did God really say that? Hmm. Here he says, if you are the Son of God. Now, God has already acknowledged that Jesus is his Son in the waters of baptism. But the devil wants Jesus to doubt who he is and to try to take care of his own needs rather than to rely on God. And the devil does that to us too. Are you sure you're a believer? Are you sure God is real? 
Are you sure that God's going to take care of you? Jesus counters it. Deuteronomy 8. I told you to, that we would come back to this. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now you know the context. And failing with the desires of the flesh, next the devil appeals to the desire of personal gain or the desire of the eyes. He takes him to the top of the temple mount. And he says, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, jump off. God will catch you. He'll send angels to catch you. You'll be okay. Prove it. He quotes or misquotes Psalm 91. Very famous psalm. A lot of our soldiers pray that psalm. It's about the protection of God. I've been to the Temple Mount. It's about 300 feet from where he's talking about to the Kidron Valley, from the top of the Temple Mount, from the pinnacle of the temple. There's a spring down at the bottom. Lots of people would have been there. So if Jesus had jumped off and the angels had come to save Jesus, everybody would know who Jesus was. And that's not what God had planned. So the devil's wanting you to get ahead of God here. Not a good idea. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. Isn't it interesting to know, though, that Jesus, or excuse me, that the devil knows Scripture? Huh. Pretty good, too. But Jesus knows it better. And that's our task as well. We may fall prey to something called proof texting where we take things out of context and make them say what we want to hear. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> so if the devil knows scripture, we got to know it better. We want to be able to say it is written. We have to have knowledge of it ourselves. We have to have God's spirit to help us understand his word, and we need context. I say this because proof texting is dangerous ground. It's done all the time in churches. You can take a passage out of context, make it say anything you want to justify something. Let me give you an example. Did you know Moses played tennis? Did y'all know that? It says in the Bible, I think it's Exodus. Moses would not serve in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> Did you know that David rode a motorcycle? It says in Scripture, David's triumph could be heard throughout the land. Oh, come on. <laughs> of course, I'm being silly here, folks, but I hope that gave you a chuckle. But you see, proof texting is, is serious business. Uh, people have been oppressed because they take God's words out of context. We can do better than that. Know your Bible. Not simply the letter of the law, but the spirit behind it that Jesus teaches be made perfect in love it's all about love Jesus says again to the devil from the top of the temple mount it is also written do not put your Lord the Lord your God to the test the devil was trying to get Jesus to force God's hand how many times have we done that we get tired of waiting on God and, and, and God to move and so we take matters into our own hands that doesn't work out so well the final temptation involves the pride of ambition or the easy path to power. The devil takes Jesus high up on a mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, promises to give Jesus all of this if he'll bow down and worship him. Now we're getting to brass tacks here. We see what the devil's after. You know, the devil's deceit hasn't changed much. Think about Eve in the garden. He used the same old tricks, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The fruit was good for food, so it appealed to Eve's appetite. It was pleasant to the eye, so it appealed to her sense of beauty. And it would make her as the gods, so it awakened her ambition. Jesus here again quotes Deuteronomy 6, saying, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I love the last part of the story. We're finishing up. Jesus says, Away from me, Satan. And guess what? The devil had to scoot, didn't he? James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Three things, submit to God, resist the devil and all of his temptations, and he will flee. 
He has to. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 say, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Someone who hadn't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights. Someone who's isolated and alone. Someone who's depressed. Someone who hasn't been coming to church and getting in the word. It says resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. How do we resist him? With a sword. Sword of the word. It is written. Know it. Use it. Because the devil comes back. Remember it said uh, somewhere he's he was waiting for an opportune time to return. Same with us. So we find ourselves sometimes back in the wilderness, don't we? We're tired, we're isolated, we're hungry for the word, we're thirsting for righteousness, we're tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We're tempted to get ahead of God, to trust in ourselves, and follow the ways of this world. But remember, Jesus said, it is written. When temptation comes our way, don't fall prey to the devil. Don't find yourself saying, the devil made me do it. Say it is written. Use the word of God as your sword. Do what Jesus taught us. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. You know, I've referenced Andre Crouch before. He's a songwriter. He's passed away now. and I think I've referenced this song. He wrote a song called Through It All. And in it, he says these words. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong. Y'all been there? But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. It is written. Know what it is. And know that if you're in the wilderness of temptation, if you're weak and you're weary and you're alone and you're afraid and you're tired or hopeless or grieving or angry or hurt or depressed, whatever wilderness you find yourself in today or tomorrow, trust in the word. Look to Jesus for your strength, and he will be there every time to lead you through the valley and take you to the place of rest and of peace. I say these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's church said, Amen. Amen. We come to our concluding moments of the service. We sing our final song. Learn to depend upon God's word. God's working in your spirit and life right now, get in contact with Reverend Reader or myself. We'll be glad to lead you with Jesus' help through the valleys. Stand and sing. <laughs> glad you joined us today, albeit virtually. I know the Spirit was in our midst. I pray that
God has given you a word from his word into your spirit today, piercing right down into your marrow, letting you know God has got you. You are his. He loves you. There is nothing that you will go through that he will not be able to deliver you from. Go forth from this place, from wherever you are, knowing it is written. And your name is written on the palm of the hands of God. You are special. Take his word. Read it. Learn it. Use it. Trust it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.